found out what real knowledge is. Gnosticism is all about having knowledge. That they had more knowledge than that early church. They had more knowledge than the apostles church. And they were going to churches and teaching this and preaching this and telling them things that like Jesus uh, was not did not come in flesh but came in something that looked like flesh but he wasn't truly flesh completely tearing down the sacrifice that Jesus had made for us for if he was not truly flesh then what he did on the cross did not have any significance but because he came into flesh and lived in the flesh that we live in and struggled with the things that we struggle with because of that when he died his sacrifice covered every single one of our sins and saved us and redeemed us but these Gnostics were coming around and saying that this was not true, that there was a greater understanding to be had, that Jesus wasn't who he says he was. In 1 John, he's teaching his churches, he's teaching his, the people how to be on the lookout for these false teachers. He's teaching them how to look for love in them, the love that only God has. He's teaching them to look for the light that only God can provide in these people. That to look for purity as only God can do in them. And that if they don't fall into the line of purity as a walk with God brings. If they don't have the love of God. If they don't shine the light of God. Then they are none of his. Right. And John is warning the church. Don't fall for this false teaching. Don't fall for this false idea of who God is and who Jesus is. And he was teaching them and telling them to stay away from it and try to look out for it and to warn them. But in the end, he said, if none of that works, just keep yourself from idols. He says little children here. He's not talking to children, but it's a, a, a term in the Greek, technion, a, a, something a teacher would say to his students. He says, let me teach you what's something that is so important. Keep yourself from idols. Yeah. Now, I don't believe John here is referencing the wooden idols of the Old Testament and the, the false idols that, were, that had popped up and the Greek mythology and those things. But within the context of the book, he's not telling them to stay away from worshiping wooden statues, but something that can be so much more sneaky and so much more damaging if allowed to happen. John was warning them not to create an idol in their mind of who Jesus is, of who God is. That we can create an image of who we think God is. Or who we want God to be. What we think God should do for us. That we can create an image in our mind of who Jesus is based on what we want from him. Or based on what we think is best. Based on what we want to happen. Maybe we even have good intentions. But if we come to our own self to try to figure out who God is. And create our own image of who God is. Without the Bible backing it up. That that is detrimental to us. And can destroy us. And John is warning them. Even if you can't pick out who is teaching falsely. Just make sure you keep your face in the Bible. Make sure you keep your mind on the Bible. On the word of God. On the letters that we have written. John was warning them to keep their, their uh, mindset of who Jesus is correct. Because these Gnostics had created their own image of who God was. Had created their own image of who Jesus was. And in doing so, when we create our own image of what God should be, really what we're doing is making ourselves a lowercase g God. When we try to change who God is to better benefit what we want. We're not serving the God. But we're trying to make ourselves a God. We cannot decide who God is. We cannot determine and make up who God is. We cannot come to the conclusion of what we believe God is and then he is that. No, we have the word of God that says who God is. 
that says who Jesus is, that speaks directly to us still today on who God is. And when we allow that God to rule our lives and we allow the God of the Bible to be our God, Amen. that's when we are in the right. Amen. That's when we've got the power of God on our side. Throughout the Bible, as you read, you can see the problem of idolatry popping up all throughout the Bible. And God hated it. He hated the thought of idolatry. He hated that his people would choose to serve a little wooden statue over the God that created the universe and that brought them out of Egypt. He hated that they would decide to do that. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah, we see a lot of God talking to his people about idol worship. Jeremiah 2 and 11 says, Has a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? Now this font is all capital. But when he says yet no gods, that's not a capital G God. But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. When we try to make God a little bit easier for us, when we try to make God a little bit prettier for ourselves, we're not helping ourselves. We are hurting ourselves. There is no profit in a God that we create. There is no profit in an, uh, in a, an idea of a God that we make up in our own mind. We don't profit from that God. The only God that provides and that gives profit is the true God of the Bible. Amen. Amen. It's the only one. But yet because we want our own way at times. Or we don't want to stop sinning. We don't want to stop doing what we've always been taught maybe. We don't want to change who we are. We would rather change our God into not a God. Amen. And change our glory and give it to something that doesn't profit us. Right. Jeremiah chapter 10. I've got quite a few scriptures here today. I hope that's okay. Amen, it is. Jeremiah chapter 10 starting at verse 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. Listen to this. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Hold it there for a minute. Yes, Lord. What he's saying here, what that means, is that they've got to be carried around everywhere that you go. Right. That's right. My God. Everywhere that when we take, when we make up our own mind of who God is, we've got to carry that around. But when the Bible tells me that the God of the word tells it says that he will carry us through our trials. He carries us through our battles. He carries us through our storm. I don't want to carry around some dumb dead God in my mind. When I've got the God of heaven willing to pick me up in my battle. Willing to hold me tight in my storm. And take me on with him. Be not afraid of them. They can't do evil. Neither can they do good. Isaiah 46, 5 and 9. God's speaking again the same thing. Verse 5 says, To whom will ye liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance. And hire a goldsmith, and he maketh it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship. They put a lot into this god. They put a lot of time, a lot of their finances, a lot of their money into something that could not help them. For look, verse 7, they bear him upon their shoulder. They carry him and set him in his place, and he standeth. I, it doesn't matter what you or I do, God's in his place. He's not moving for anybody. He's not changing for anybody. He is who he says he is. He is who he has always been. 
and we don't have to try to bring him along with us. He takes us into deeper places. He takes us with him. We don't have bruises on our shoulders from carrying our God around. He picks us up and takes us with him. He picks us up when we can't go anymore, when we can't walk any farther, when we can't make it on our own. Our God, my God, picks me up when I can't stand anymore. From his place shall he not be moved. Yea, one shall cry unto him. Yea, can he not answer, nor save him out of his trouble. Remember this, and show yourselves, men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Let me tell you, no matter what you think, no matter what you've got going on, no matter how good your job may be, there is no one and nothing like our God. You can put all of your time, all of your money, all of your attention into the things of this world or into a God that you create in your mind but through false perception, but that God will not hear you when you cry. He will not carry you when you fall, but yet it stands still. It does not move. God wants to help us. He wants to be there for us. Amen. He wants to provide for us. Yes. We talk a lot about trials and things we're going through. And yes, through the, the things that we go through in life, we've got to face hardships and trials come and doubts come about and the enemy will attack. But it's not God's will to keep us dangling all the time. Right. It's not God's will to keep us wandering all the time. Right. He provides for his people. He takes care of his people when we put him where he belongs in our mind. Right. When we let him be who he says he is. Yeah. When we let him do what he wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. God came to Jeremiah. And said, I want you to put this sash around your waist, tied around your waist. And he wore it there tight around his waist for a little while. And then God spoke to him, I want you to take that off and go bury it somewhere. So he did. He went and buried it. And then it says, many days later, God spoke to him and said, go dig that sash back up. And when he dug it up and looked at it, it was beat up, it was bruised, it was ripped, it was raw, it was old, and it was being torn apart down there in the ground. And God said, talking about this in Jeremiah 13, verse 10, this evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. God wants to wrap himself around us and wrap us together and keep us together. But what we do when we stop looking at him as God and start looking to something else as our God, we separate ourselves from him. And all we do is dig ourselves down into a hole to be beaten, to be torn up, to be destroyed. God said in verse 11, for as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of the man, or as that, that sash was wrapped so tight around that waist of that man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. God only wants to take us closer to him. Take us further than we can get on our own. God has given us this word not to cause us to have to stop doing things that we want to do, but to protect us from the things of this world that want to destroy us. And when we look at this word, and unfortunately it happens all too often nowadays, 
That we can look at the word of God and say, yeah, I like that, but I don't like this. Come on. I believe this and I'll follow this, but this part seems a little bit outdated. This part seems a little too harsh. This part seems, I, I don't think I'm ready to, to change that yet, to do that yet. I'm going to just kind of forget about that part. And when we do that, we manipulate the image that God has given to us through his word. And in so doing, we create our own God in our mind. We create a false God in our mind. You cannot take a little bit of the word and leave a little bit of it there. It's either all true or it's all false. We've either got to take all of it or leave it all behind because we can't change it. We can't add to it. We can't take from it. This is God. This is the image of God. This is the word of God. This is who God is. And when we change that, we don't only change the way that he looks, but we take away his power and we take away his mercy and we take away his grace and we take away his glory and we take away who he wants to be to us when we try to change the word to better fit our intentions and our ideas and our mindset. I know this might be a little heavy today. But we've got to stop taking a little bit of the word and leaving a little bit of it behind. Right. Yes. We've either got to be all Bible or throw it out into the trash. Right. Because if we're not going to follow it all, then the rest of it doesn't work together. This Bible is better put together than the finest watch you can find. Every gear works together to grind the next one, to work the next hand. Every part of it works together. If we take something out because we don't like it, or we take something out because it doesn't fit our ideas, then we are completely destroying who God wants to be in our lives. In James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, James, such, a, a, such awesome words here, says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. You deceive yourself when you don't follow what the Bible says. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. The Bible is supposed to be to not, a, not a reflection of us, but to show us our reflection, to show us who we are to show us the things that we need to change, the things that we need to get right. God is putting up a mirror in front of us and saying, you don't quite match this word. Why don't you change this a little bit? Change that. I've got something better for you if you just trust me. But when we don't follow what the word says, we walk away and we completely forget and don't change who we were. It's like every young person, they look in the mirror in the morning. They're not walking away until the hair is right. Till the pimples are popped. Till the scragglies are shaved. Hallelujah. Because a mirror isn't just to show us how great we look. A mirror is to show us the things that we need to fix and get right. And that's what the Bible wants to be for us. It's not meant to, to, to just lift us up and, and, and build us up. But it's meant to show us the things that we need to change. But he says in verse 25. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. The ones that look at this Bible and say, that's, that's a little tough. But if the Bible says it, I'm going to do it. The ones that look into this Bible and look into the words and say, I don't know if I'm quite ready for that yet. But if God says I can do it, then I'm going to do it. Yeah. The ones that say, I've never done that before. But God says I need to do it, so I'm going to do it. And those who look into this perfect law and continue with it, keeps going forward in it. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed 
in what he does. Hallelujah. We find blessing when we change ourselves to better resemble the word of God. We've got to let God be who he says he is. We've got to let God be what he wants to be in our lives. We've got to let God do what it is that he wants to do in our lives. Amen. Now I know, as to my knowledge at least, nobody in this room, including myself, are Bible scholars. I don't claim it by any means to know this Bible backward and frontward. I don't believe that anyone can truly ever know all the deepness and the intricacies of this word of God. Amen. We can get them as much of the history and the locations and the names and memorizing and go back to the Hebrew and the Greek to find out what was really said. We can do all of that. But yet through the Holy Ghost, God reveals even more than we can just read. Right. So we can wonder how, how can I formulate my life around this word when I don't even really understand what it says maybe for some of us. But I've got good news for us. That on top of studying our Bible and reading, God has also given us a man of God in our life to be able to speak the word into our lives. To show us the things that we need Amen. to change. To show us the things that we need to start doing. Amen. Our pastor, our shepherd, and I am aware that almost every time I get up here, I talk about how we need to follow and do and be who the pastor is, is working with God to, 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 to lead us into. But it is so true. Amen. Amen. In Exodus chapter 19, after the Israelites had come out of Egypt so miraculously and seen all kinds of other great things going on. God provided water for them and took away the bitterness out of it. And God provided food and all of these things that God had done for them. And they came to Mount Sinai. And God said that he wanted to speak to the people. So Moses prepared them and brought the people there to Mount Sinai. And God wanted to show them through his word, through his talking, that Moses was where he was supposed to be, that Moses was their leader. And God began to speak with Moses and the Israelites heard the thunderings of his voice and the, the loud, the, the earth shaking, the mountain quaking as God spake so mightily and powerfully revealing to the Israelites that Moses is their leader, is their shepherd, is their pastor, that Moses was there because God put him there. And then God called Moses up higher. And said, the people can't come up here yet. They're not ready to come up here. They're not prepared to come up here. But Moses, you come up here and I'll teach you what to teach them. Yes, yes. And so Moses went up into Mount Sinai and had conversation with God. And God laid out a new plan for his people. A new direction for his people through the covenant and the tabernacle and the sacrifices. God had a plan to take his people from uh, runaway slaves as they were then into a great nation. Right. And that's the same intention that God still has for us today. That's right. That's right. We're not just sinners saved by grace. I thank God that I am a sinner saved by his grace. But God has called me to so much more than to just be saved by grace. Right. And he's called you and he's called us to be more than just a bunch of runaway slaves that got out of the world in time. He's calling us to be a great people, a great nation, a great church. He's calling us to be the body of God, the body of Christ. And he's put a man above us through our pastor. That God is working with the pastor to help get us to where God wants us to be. We can get things from God. We can hear from God. But without a pastor in our life, not just that we hear every Sunday, but that we submit to and allow to speak into our lives, we can never be the men and the women, the people of God that God has called us to be because God gives the plans to his leader, Amen. to his pastor. 
And then we jump forward in Exodus 32. Moses is still up on Mount Sinai talking to God, getting this great plan that God has for the Israelites. And they decided to forget about everything that Moses had told them. To forget about everything that God had given to Moses to tell them. They decided to forget about all that Moses had tried to lead them in. And all that God had been doing. Because they got tired of waiting. Come on, man. God doesn't work on our timeline and our time frame. Sometimes we've got to let God work as he sees fit while we just keep going on in the direction that God and our pastor has set us on. But the Israelites grew weary and bored and tired of sitting there and they decided to make their own God. And they even called Aaron. Let me tell you, if the second in command is willing to go against what the pastor says, he's no better than anyone else. Just because Aaron was the priest and just because Aaron was the second in command, he still went against God's will and he still went against the man of God's will. Don't come to me to asking me for something if the pastor already said no. Right. Don't come to Sean asking him for Amen. something if the pastor has already yes. said no. He is my pastor as much as he is your pastor. Yes. And I follow him as much as you should yes. follow him. But these Israelites went to Aaron and asked him to make them a god. My god. And he did the wrong thing. My lord. He had them bring their gold. And it's so... I remember reading this not too long ago and this jumping out at me in a way that I'd never seen it before. I know that they had made a golden calf and, and they wanted to worship the golden calf. But I never quite grasped this point here. It says in chapter 32, verse 4, it says he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation. Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. In the Bible here, whenever you see all capital Lord, most King James versions, all capital L-O-R-D, but the capital L is a little bit larger than the rest, that always translates into their understanding of who God was, which was Yahweh, Jehovah. Aaron wasn't saying we've made another God. He wasn't saying we're leaving God, we're leaving church. We're walking away from it. Instead, we're just going to make it look the way we want it to look. He didn't call this golden calf a God. He called it the Yahweh, the Jehovah, the God. Without the pastor's leadership, they tried to make God look the way they thought it should look. And they were completely wrong and completely false. And what did it lead to? It led into sexual promiscuity. It led into sinfulness. It led into all kinds of disaster. Because they stopped serving the God that Moses was serving. And that Moses was preaching. And that Moses was teaching them. And they made their own God. And called it the God. We can still do the very same thing here today. I go to church. I'm there every Sunday. But don't ask me to stop doing this. Don't ask me to stop doing that. Don't ask me to start coming on Saturdays for outreach. I'm not doing that. Don't ask me to do more than I want to do. I've got enough of God. I've got my own good thing with God. I've got what I need from God. And what we have done is remove the power from God. We've removed his redemption power from him. We've removed the mercy and the grace. And we serve a God that is of no profit to us. Right. Amen. Come on. Hey. Hallelujah. Jesus. Mm, Jesus. I've tried to make it in this life on my own. And I couldn't do it. 
So what good is it if I make God resemble my wants and my thoughts and my desires? What good is it if I create a God that looks like me? My God, my God. No power, no strength can't help us. Guess what? When I sin and I repent, God forgives me like this. It takes me a while to forgive myself because I don't have as much mercy and grace for myself as God has. If I create my own God, I don't have the mercy and the grace that I need from God. And I don't have the power to go through this life without God. If I make my own God and I make him who I want him to be, to look like I want him to look like. We've got to let him be who he says he is. We've got to let him speak into our lives through this word, through our Bible studies, through the pastor's messages, through the word that comes from this pulpit that the pastor allows. We've got to stop making God who we want him to be and start serving the God as he created, as he gave to us, as he made him known unto us. Isaiah 42 and 8. God says, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven images. If we make our own God out of what we want the word to say, we've got nothing. But our own ideas, maybe some nice words, some nice words to give us some encouragement. I believe without the Holy Ghost, the Bible can give us encouragement. There's a lot of encouraging words in this Bible. There's a lot of encouraging words that we can read out of nowhere and it just help us because this is the word of God. But to truly grasp the power of the word. To truly be what God is calling us to be. To truly be a people that God is calling us to be. We can't just take the encouraging words of the Bible and leave it at that. We can't just take our verse of the day and read it and feel better about ourselves and go about our day. We've got to shape our lives around God's word and who he says that he is. God will not give his glory to another. He will not give his power to another. He will not give his mercy to another. He's not going to help your God so that you can feel better. He's going to keep being God. He's going to keep doing what God does. And we can either join in with him or we can be beaten by this world by trying to serve a God that I create. He is the Lord. That is his name. That was not that golden cast name. That's not my idea of what God is his name. That is his name. And his glory he will not give to another. And he will not give his praise or let praise be given to any graven images. He's a jealous God. But then we read, change it a little bit here, a different direction, change gears. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 5. We preach not ourselves. I'm not here to tell you my opinions. What I think you should do. My opinions have gotten me into more ditches. Than I care to admit. I'm not here to preach you my ideas. And my thoughts. And what has worked best for me. I'm here to preach Jesus. Because he is all that has worked for me. And ourselves your servants. For Jesus sake. Verse 6, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face 
of Jesus Christ. You know who you should be serving and worshiping and living your life after and trying to make yourself look like. It's not your idea of who God is, but it is Jesus. It is Jesus, man. God manifested in the flesh. It is Jesus in the words of those that he called to his apostles. Those that followed after his will and followed after his word. Jesus is the only image that we follow. And those that he showed his image to. If we want to know what God looks like, we look at Jesus. If we want to know what God likes, we look at Jesus. If we want to know how we can be like God, we look at Jesus. Jesus is all of the Old Testament God brought down into a point so that he can be clearly defined and clearly recognized. It is Jesus that we face and that we serve and that we put our life around. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. Let me tell you, you can change the word to help yourself feel better if you choose to. You can change the word to match what you want it to match and to say what you want it to say. But the only way to get to God, the only way to get the grace of God, the only way to get the mercy of God, the only way to get the power of God is to live our lives after what Jesus said to live our lives after. Jesus is our image of who God is. Jesus is who he says that he is. Hallelujah. When Jesus taught his apostles and taught his followers, he wasn't just helping them to be better. He was teaching them how he would do things and what his will is and what his way is. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost with the keys to get to, to heaven in his hand and said that we must repent and we must be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of our sins and we receive the Holy Ghost. That wasn't Peter's idea. That wasn't Peter's image of what God was. That wasn't Peter's thoughts on what he thought was best. That was the image of Jesus being presented to the people through Peter. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Holy Ghost because it wasn't there yet. It is God's will. And we are like God when we repent every day. When we get baptized in the name of Jesus. When we let the Holy Ghost not just show up one time through the evidence of speaking in tongues. But to flow from our bellies like a river flowing. That is who God is. That is God's will. And teach the word of God to all that we can. That is who God is. When we live a life after holiness, as the word says to, that is who God is. When we lay down our worldly pleasures, when we lay down our secular music, lay down our worldly entertainment, when we lay all that stuff down, because the Bible says we should, that is who God is. And that is who we follow. And that is where the power is at. We've got to let God out of the box and be who he says he is. The God that fits in here can't save the world. But the God of this Bible can save every last human being on this planet. He can change every situation. He can meet every need. Every sickness can be healed. Every need can be met. Every lost loved one can find God when we let him be who he says that he is. Oh, let's worship the Lord right now. Let's worship Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and sin right now. Let's give that worship and that praise unto God. Let's thank the name of Jesus that he has revealed.